Not in the respiratory system. Well, that's kind of vague. We don't want to. Where? In the bloodstream. In the blood chemistry. Okay? Uh, now, of course, you know, there are no actual letters and arrows in, in the bloodstream. get into this formula and what this blood chemistry means, uh, let's go back to your freshman year. You all know any shorter. Okay. Same height. Same height. And uh, this cut review some basic biology. Now, you know, the basic biology is cellular respiration. What is the whole goal of that? ATP. Energy in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. What is the purpose of that molecule? What's it used for? Energy by whom or what? Cells. Cells. <clears throat> it's the basic form of energy that your cells use to do what? Well, everything is pretty basic. Produce protein. Now you're going to have to start reading passes or something. Uh, what, what is going on? Adios, I don't want to see you. Uh, they go hang outside somewhere. Figure this out. So, um, what is it used for? Yeah, to say everything. Give me three You said that um, most of the body's ATP is used by the uh, the pump of the on the uh, plasma membrane. Yeah, during the potassium the, pump. Yeah, so that's where <laughs> at any time. A large percentage of them is being used anywhere else. What about doing this? Oh, Back to the muscle. Everything to sodium potassium pump, rebuilding new cells. Uh, yeah, anything. Any work a cell has to do. Repairing itself, building a new cell, manufacturing protein. Uh, this point correct from a photocopy not listening. Otherwise, it would be ugly. Um, yeah, that, that is the only energy you use. It's like the fuel, money of a cell. Which cells in your body is ATP? All of them. All of them. Almost all of these cells on the planet. There's only a few exceptions that use another form. Okay? Uh, so that's what you need. Well, how do you get it? Cellular respiration. Where does that occur? <laughs> in the cell, but more specifically in an organelle called the mitochondria. mitochondria, known as the powerhouse of the cell, right? Remember that? Yes. Yeah. What exactly does that mean? So here's the reaction for cellular respiration, right? Now, first thing, don't tell me to tell you out, go run in here and yell at me. Why? Why would you yell at me for writing that on the board? It's not balanced. Oh. <laughs> you have balance? Can you balance? I hope. <laughs> well, it's going to be six days, so. Anyway, it's conceptual. Okay? So again, you have no actual formulas in your mitochondria. You look under the microscope. So, what are our reactants? Mm -hmm. We have C6, H12, O6, which of course is glucose. Where do you get that from? Food. What kind of food? Actually, any kind of food can be converted to glucose if necessary. Okay? It's not the easiest way to do it, but it's necessary. Okay, oxygen, of course, from the atmosphere. Water from just about all kinds of sources, food or drink. Okay, remember, all water, all food has some water in it. Uh, there are organisms that won't drink water, they just take it from their food. Okay, so that's our reactants. What are our products? Our waste. Carbon dioxide, some more water, and our goal, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So just a reminder, how does the cell actually get energy out of ATP? By breaking it down into ATP and ATP, breaking, so three phosphates into two phosphates plus the free one, and you've broken a bond and liberated some energy, and energy can be used to make so, exactly pump fuel. 
muscle protein or whatever. Right? How do you build ATP? By putting them back together with energy, the reverse. Okay? So that energy comes from the bonds and the glucose yeah. molecule and it's transferred into the ATP molecule. You can't create energy. Everyone knows that? Mm -hmm. You create energy, you don't tell anybody what you do. <coughs> and you get really rich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you're going to tell me, are you? Okay. So let's look at this is what's happening in the mitochondria or out near the outside of the mitochondria sometimes, part of it. Um, in the human, where do we get these things? Where do we get glucose? What system? Digestive system. Okay, which we'll study next. And that delivers it directly to your cells, mitochondria, right? Right? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> you gotta go through the cardiovascular system to get there, right? Oh. Bloodstream. The cells are not waiting next to your stomach for the glucose. They have to get there through the bloodstream, the capillaries. Oxygen, of course, we get from atmosphere and how does it arrive in the cells? Respiratory and cardiovascular. Okay. Water is readily available because the body is mostly water. You just have to kind of maintain it. You can take some in, you can lose some, but you're just kind of maintaining it. There's no problem with getting water for a cell. So all this place. Why is it that athletes have to hydrate? Oh. Heat liberation. Heat liberation? Yes. Not that an athlete ever has to hydrate. Yeah, but it's not stress as much as. Well, I mean, like if you're an athlete, well, you're anyone, who, anyone who is producing work. Athletic, farmer, or okay. yeah, it had to do with sweating and cooling. So you're gonna give off that stress. It had to do a little bit with the thing you're doing. Sweat and breathing. Give off heat, like evaporating water. So what about our waste product? How do we get those out? Well, carbon dioxide, we how do we get it out? Well, where do we exhale? Uh, we got to get it there. Diffuse it into the bloodstream, right? And then into the lungs, the alveoli, and out, right? Does, does it go out from the cell directly? Does it get to the exit? Water is basically left there or moved around wherever it's needed. And of course, you have the molecule we want. Okay, so in this system, what we're talking about really is how to get this in and get this out without blowing the whole thing up. Why would you blow up? Well, uh, figuratively, we could definitely screw things up royally. Hopefully, after your research, you realize that. Oh, yeah. So, that's some basic freshman stuff, just to remind you. We got a few more over there. So what in the world does that have to do with this? Well, this is a formula that happens in the bloodstream. Actually, it happens anytime carbon dioxide combines with water, which of course, carbon dioxide and lots of water in the bloodstream, right? Have you ever done the experiment, and maybe as a freshman, where you're blowing bubbles into the colored stuff? Yeah, yeah. Do you know so we'll do it. We're going to get to it in July. Um, <laughs> blowing bubbles into water. Now, you realize in your bloodstream there's no bubbles, right? Uh -huh. Dissolved gases. Bubbles would be fatal. Heart can't pump the gas. Um, so when the carbon dioxide reacts with water, it very quickly forms what other molecule? something called carbonic acid, which in then in turn will dissociate into two ions. Hydrogen ions, and this one is called bicarbonate. Okay? So anytime you take CO2 and mix it with water, this will start to happen. So it's created an acid. Okay? Now in the body, this happens real quickly because some of you read about an enzyme. Carbonic anhydrase. I'm not going to require you to know that, but it happens real quickly. There's a reason for that. Okay? So, the 
this is what happens. Those are our players in this, whatever this buffering system is. Why does it have those funny arrows on the thing? What does that mean? Well, what does that mean in equilibrium? We can't go in either. It actually goes in both directions simultaneously. It's kind of a balancing act. What determines which way it goes? How could you make it go to the right? You can either increase this or decrease this, right? To be, and it would cause it to balance. How can you make it go that way? You either increase this or decrease this. That's, well, that's an intermediary. <coughs> if somehow that were, well, you can't make that without having one of these, but if you were somehow at it, it would just, would affect it. So we said this happens in the bloodstream. Now the question is, where in the bloodstream does it move in one direction? And where does it move in the other direction? We have to be a little more specific. So it's actually called the systemic capillary fluid. Don't usually use that. So where would this go to the right? Near the cells of the capillaries. Why? What's going on at the cells? From what? Cellular respiration. Cellular respiration at the cells is producing CO2, which diffuses into the bloodstream, right? Mm -hmm. CO2 diffuses right through the membrane. You make it, it's going to diffuse out. Well, as soon as, which means this is going to start increasing, and it's going to drive this to that direction. What if I put it the other way? Then? Reverse it. Or write it vertically or circular. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> so at the cells, in the capillaries of the cell, the systemic capillaries of the cell, it will drive the one to the right. It will form these things, right? Mm -hmm. Well, at what location will it reverse direction? Mm -hmm. Pulmonary capillaries. The capillaries near the lungs, the pulmonary capillaries. Why will it reverse direction? <laughs> What's it? Why? It's going to be exhaled. As the CO2 is being exhaled, it'll start diffusing into the alveoli and dropping. And that will pull things back in this direction. So it goes one way at the cells, transported, and reverses when it gets to the lungs. So the CO2 forms, you can see the CO2 in here, right? Yeah. The, bi the bicarbonate, right? And then it transports in this form, and then goes back into this form at the lungs and exhale. You can't exhale bicarbonate. Right? <coughs> so transport, return. So this is blood chemistry. Sounds simple enough, right? That's how you get the CO2 out mm -hmm. of the cells, and then exhale. Well, it's not quite that simple, is it? Can anyone tell me why? Is there a problem here? Well, we just explained basically how CO2 is transported through the bloodstream. It's converted to this, and then converted to that, and exhaled. But is there a problem with that scenario? Do you see a problem up here? There's a big problem. Huh? No one? What? The guy circled in red. The hydrogen ion. Why are those a problem? They are, they are literally the definition of pH in an acid. What does pH stand for, brother? P and the H. I don't know about the P, but the H is hydrogen. Parts hydrogen. Yeah. It's a negative logarithmic scale of the hydrogen ion concentration. Anyway, this is a big problem. Because you're now creating an acid. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about pH. Let's go back to freshman. At least I did this in class before. What literally is pH? Where did it come from? You hear the spring?
Wayne Burke is kicking papers and turn colors and all that. What in the world is it? Yeah, where do they come from? Where do these hydrogen ions come from? Well, here's my explanation. It comes from water. If you take a beaker of pure water and just water molecules, which is actually fairly difficult to do, enough to have something else in there, but theoretically, if you do, or nearly do that, it will build. It's distilled, but everything think you still manage to get in there somehow. Uh, what starts to happen to a certain percentage of it? It starts to disassociate into two ions. What are those ions? Hydrogen, Hydrogen and what's this one? Hydroxide. I can just call it OH, because they're confusingly similar. Now, if it's just water molecules, you're going to dissociate equal concentrations. They're balanced. And what pH would that be? Seven, Seven or neutral or balanced pH, where the concentrations are equal. And this is where <coughs> living things like to live, near there somewhere. Unless you see the movie Alien, and has acid for blood or something. You know, life generally is around neutral. So that's balanced pH. You should have that in shampoo commercials. It's balanced pH. And people like me don't know what that meant. Like, well, who cares? All right. Well, let's say you add something to the water that causes it to produce hydrogen ions and you shift the balance on that side. You are now creating something that's acidic. And it could be all the way down as low as zero or one, right? If you add something to the water that creates hydroxide ions, you're making it basically alkaline. It could be as high as 14. It's just a balancing. You know anything you could add to water to make a base? Something you probably use in chemistry class? The most common base, probably. Use this. What is this? A white tower called sodium hydroxide. That's sodium bicarbonate. That is a base too, but it's much weaker. Okay, well, can you see where the OH ions come from? Mm -hmm. Everybody see them right here? Mm -hmm. Is it dissociates? That's going to make it basic. This one gets up to about 10, I think. We'll actually use it. You know anything you can add to water to produce hydrogen ions? What's this? Hydrochloric acid. H gets it down to 1. Or you can add. Carbon dioxide makes it acidic too. So yeah, that's what pH is. But why is it so important? Well, first of all, I'm pretty sure I asked you, what is the pH of the blood in a human required to be? 7.35 to 7.45. A very, very narrow range. That is about as sen sensitive to the homeostasis rules as there is. If your blood pH falls outside of this, what happens? As the freshman's favorite word is, you die. Exactly. You're either going to what's called acidosis or alkalosis. Living organisms are enormous, extremely sensitive to pH changes. Um, now, not every organism is 7.35 or 7.45. The question is, why is pH so important? Why can it not be allowed to change almost at all? Well, hopefully you learned in chemistry class that if you start changing pHs, what happens? Like what? Basic, every reaction is dependent on the pH. Okay? Basic chemistry, you have to control the pH of a chemist are doing this constantly. They have to control the reaction's pH if it changes, it completely throws off the reaction. Just like temperature and pressure and things like that, concentration. Uh, pH greatly alters chemistry. Well, why is that important to you? Well, you're basically a chemistry set. And if you change the pH, proteins start falling apart. Everything just goes haywire. So you can't be allowed to change the pH of the body. Okay. The pro if you, tr okay, I'll, well, let's go for it. Something that you use to control pH and keep it from moving is called a buffer. Okay. That could be any of many things. Chemists use many types of buffers. It's just another source of error, a variable you can't have in here. So, 
pH is critical for chemistry and obviously then critical for living things. You can't just allow it to change constantly. So we have a problem here, don't we? Because this is dramatically going to cause your pH in your bloodstream to go up or down. 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 Don't fall for the pH trap. What's your pH trap? Hydrogen ions go up, pH goes down. Be careful. Right? It's a negative log scale. So how in the world can this be allowed to happen without destroying yourself? So let's talk about this. Let's talk about how gases are transported through the bloodstream. Okay. Obviously there's oxygen and then there's carbon dioxide. Is oxygen a problem? No. Does oxygen combine and form pH or anything else? No. And you already know how it's transported. How is it transported? Well, yeah, specifically. Hemoglobin. Red blood cells and the protein hemoglobin. Okay, this is a hemoglobin molecule. It's a protein. Hopefully you know that this is a drawing of a protein. It's, the amino acids are twisty. They make different shapes. That's what they do. This is a representation of hemoglobin, which is on the red cell. And you can see it has what's called four heme groups, and it can bind four molecules of oxygen. Okay, this should be very familiar to AP Biologists, I hope. Yep. Okay. So there's four spots on each hemoglobin protein to bind oxygen. And here's a heme group, one of these. What do you see right in the middle? Iron. 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 So now you know the iron requirement, right? Uh -huh. So this is how the vast majority of oxygen is transported to the bloodstream. It's referred to as oxyhemoglobin when it's combined. Got it? It's picked up by the lungs through diffusion and delivered to the, to the cells and then diffuses into the cell or respiratory. Doesn't cause any problems. Not, that's the vast majority of the way it's carried. Now, there is a small amount of oxygen di dissolved directly in the plasma of the water. But it's basically oxygen on its way to or from the hemoglobin. That's all it is. Causes no problems, simple enough. But there's CO2. Does that cause problems? Yeah. Absolutely. So as soon as you take CO2 in water, you're going to start making these things. So let's talk about how you can transport CO2 out without destroying your body chemistry. Well, there's multiple ways. They're a little bit more complicated. CO2 is transported. By the way, it's right in your book. And some people saw this and used it for the research. CO2 is transported in three ways. The smallest percentage, about 7%, is dissolved directly in the plasma, in the water. It could be very high, otherwise you would have a problem with this, right? So that's the smallest percentage. It's called dissolved CO2. The second highest percentage, around a quarter, 23%, is in this form. What does this look like? Called carb amino hemoglobin. What do you think that is? Hemoglobin mixed with carbon. Carbon dioxide. Now you need to tell me. I thought carbon uh, hemoglobin carried oxygen. You mean it can also carry carbon dioxide? Yes. Yes. We call it hemomagnificent. How is that possible? Well, beside these heme groups, there's another site that can carry a single CO2 molecule. Do they, proteins have many sites, they're called domains, they can do many things. You have some that carry oxygen, you have another one that carries a CO2. Do they compete with each other? No. Uh -huh. They can carry both at the same time. So not only does it carry oxygen, it can carry CO2. It's called carb amino hemoglobin. But still, that's not very much. That's only 30%. We still have the vast majority we have to get out of there. How is that done? Well, by converting the CO2 into bicarbonate ion, and then, like I said, converting it back. And that's how the majority of CO2 is transported in this form. You can see it in here. Simple as that. All done. Taken care of? No problem? Big problem. Why? Because if you're making this, you're also making a lot of this. 
And this is a big problem, as we just stated, right? So how in the world can we transport this without allowing you to destroy this? Well, I'll give you one guess as to who solved that problem as well. Nemo the Magnificent. Is a movie we'll watch when we have a little more knowledge. Because not only it does it transport oxygen, not only does it about almost all the oxygen, not only does it transport about 25% of the CO2, it also buffers the hydrogen ions. What does that mean? It literally takes them out of the solution. And if it occupies them and takes it out of the solution, is it a pH problem? So this one molecule can do all that. And when that thing evolved, things really took off. So transport almost all the oxygen, some of the CO2, and gets rid of the hydrogen ions. So as your cells produce CO2 from cellular respiration, it can be converted.